Good evening and welcome to Direct Impact Broadcasting, the station of growth and transformation. Affiliate of Creative Broadcasting presents Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson with your host, Taiwana Wilson, as she welcomes her guest to the studio. Welcome to Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson. I am your host, Taiwana Wilson. A little bit about myself. I am your award-winning leadership maven, medical laboratory sciences by background, best-selling author, owner and chief leadership coach at Trendy Elite Coaching and Consulting Services, executive director with the John Maxwell team, Maxwell Dish Certified Consultant, Send Out Cards Referral Partner, and co-owner of Direct Impact Broadcasting Radio Station. Before we bring on my special guest, I want to highlight our May fundraising initiative in conjunction with the Alzheimer's Association's Longest Day campaign for those affected by Alzheimer's disease or dementia. We have a goal this month to raise $500 in honor of my grandmother, Juanita Hardy, by the end of the month. So this year will mark one year since she passed of dementia. So Donations can be made at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash T-E longest day. I am also excited to announce the Trendy Elite eight-week Empowerment Tribe program launching very soon. Check out my website, www.coachtwilson.com and social media channels for more information about this program. I would like to say thank you to my media mentors, Ms. Ashley Lutzel and Ms. Kimberly McLemore of Talk Radio TV Network, LLP. Today's special guest is my friend and fellow Kentucky State University alum, Mr. Nason Buchanan, also known as Tyree. So Tyree <laughs> was raised in Glen Park Community in Gary, Indiana, Nason's purpose and goal has long centered on empowering youth and their families, and he has since become a dedicated and influential man of service in Los Angeles. Since early 2001, Buchanan has worked with the Los Angeles Mayor's Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development, or GERD. The GERD program is a comprehensive gang reduction program and aims to effectively reduce gang crime and violence in specific geographic areas or GERD zones through the application of evidence-based gang prevention, intervention, and re-entry strategies. Beginning as a regional manager, he covered multiple GERD zones in Los Angeles South Bureau while collaborating with a range of stakeholders, including intervention agencies, LAPD divisions, community organizations, community members, schools, faith-based institutions, and juvenile justice agencies. Since Mayor Eric Garcetti took office in 2013, Buchanan has continued to lead within the GERD office, facilitating various initiatives for proactive peacekeeping, including the city's gun by gun buyback program, President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative, and prevention strategy within the South South Los Angeles GERD zones, while also increasing organizations, partnerships, and alliances citywide. He also led the Mayor's Office GERD Domestic Violence and Gang Nexus initiative across the city and continues to work with other community stakeholders to shape important education awareness campaigns, trainings, and crucial organization no collaborations. Buchanan has also spearheaded, developed, and executed multiple programs that have significantly contributed to the success of the GERD office as well as the city as a whole. He launched expungement and gang injunction workshops as well as a mother's form and job readiness course, which were attended by South LA community members and helped many individuals to become productive and significant contributors for their children and families. In collaboration with LAPD, Buchanan implemented a use of force training for community leaders and clergy to educate them on a portion of police policy that has a large impact on the way issues are perceived by the public. Further collaboration with LAPD has yielded a South LA cookout for the community, a Divine Nine, and LAPD 
committee as well as a gang training and gang injunction training for the GERD staff. In order to maximize intervention's role and coverage in South Los Angeles, Buchanan helped institute and facilitate the South LA strategy team and gang ambassador program. Additional positive relationships were built that led to increased safety in South Los Angeles and a decrease in crime. In addition to lead numerous programs and initiatives throughout the city, Buchanan has also been invited to a variety of speaking engagements, community forums, and conferences, locally, nationally, and internationally. He has had the honor of providing his knowledge and support alongside individuals from the city attorney's office, LAPD, California Assembly, and State Senate, U.S. representatives, and other federal entities to engage and empower communities to stay active in areas such as gun violence, boys and men of color, reducing recidivism, and gang prevention and intervention. Outside of Los Angeles, Buchanan spoke at the Community Safety Symposium, where he offered his insight and expertise about implementing a successful gang intervention program in notorious South Los Angeles. He presented and contributed to the Caribbean Basin Security Initiatives Work Group of Preventing Crime in Kingston, Jamaica, where he not only shared his insight into successful prevention programming for at-risk youth, but began to forge international partnerships to expand his reach. Because of his success and expertise in Jamaica, Buchanan was invited to participate in the Fight for Peace, UNESCO, International Conference in Rio de Janeiro. Here he continued to share success, successes from GERD intervention programming and also provided additional expertise on the effectiveness of sports and youth-focused violence prevention programs in urban communities affected by high levels of crime and violence. He continued to build partnerships in Brazil and looked forward to sharing his expertise and successes with other communities and countries in order to enrich and improve lives worldwide. Buchanan's accomplishments and leadership through the Los Angeles Mayor's Office empower him to further develop and hone his skills and expertise so that his reach can continue to expand. In addition to his work, he is the founder of DMTL, nonprofit organization. The initials bear the names of immediate family members that he lost to a violent crime in 2002. He is also a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated and serves on the board of directors for Brother to Brother Mentorship Organization and Sunburst Youth Academy Foundation. In 2017, Buchanan completed the Justice Policy Network Criminal Justice Reform Fellowship. This experience, combined with his other activism and leadership, has lended him the opportunity to connect and build alliances with future leaders citywide, striving to improve the criminal justice system. Buchanan transitioned to the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, Office of Reentry in 2018, to focus his efforts to serve justice, involved individuals transitioning back into our communities. This evening we have Mr. Nason Tyree Buchanan. So, Mr. Nason, <laughs> how are you doing this evening? Yes, what's up? What's up? What's up, King State? Yeah. What's up? Y'all, I, I got to say that you, you got to excuse me a little. I'm kind of under the weather. It's been like, it's been cold out here in Cali. It's like in the 60s. And I'm catching a cold a little bit, so you got to excuse me a little bit. But uh, I want to say uh, I want to thank you for having me on your show. I feel blessed for that. And I want to congratulate you on have a, having a successful podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you feel yeah. better. 60-degree weather sounds awesome <laughs> <laughs> here in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. Well, no, you got you got a great show. I, I listened to you had Kobe on there. You had uh, Eddie Eddie Melton on there. I went to school with them gentlemen, and uh, I'm a fan as well. 
Awesome, awesome. I am so happy to hear that. So so that the listeners get to know a little bit more about you, tell the listeners about your leadership journey and how did you get to where you are today? I go way back, you know. I think uh, um, I've always been, I think not too long ago I, I realized I'm an introvert, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Growing up, I went from shy to quiet to reserved to laid back, but always kind of preserved. And so just growing up, <clears throat> um, I, I had the opportunity to grow up with two fathers in my life. And, um, you know, I, I can I can recall a, a story my biological father told me when I was young. And he said, uh, always be a leader. Don't be a follower. He said, uh he grew up on the south side of Chicago. I grew up in Gary, Indiana. He told me, he said, when he was younger, he said that one of his buddies came and got him and said, hey, come over here. Let's let's go um, break in somebody's house real quick. And he said, <laughs> I know that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so they went to this house, and my father, friend, told him, hey, you go in, you go in first. And my father said, no, you go in first. And so um, – the guy proceeded to go in. Once he got in, somebody shot his head off with a salt on shotgun. And so wow. the more of that story my father tell me, you know, never be a follower. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was he was raw and uncut like that, you know. And so this um hearing raw and uncut stories like that when I was younger, my um uh my step pops would sit us down and, and Gary and would talk to us about uh, just trying to be a leader, you know. And so my thing was sports. Sports kind of got me into realizing that I was a leader, where I, I would be like if you go back to like Little League baseball, uh, Pop Warner football, uh, Biddy basketball, all of this I, I did in Glen Park, in the Glen Park area, and I would become captains on the team. And so I realized there's different types of leadership, you know. And mm-hmm. I was more so the, the – my style was the leading by example and uh, wasn't really verbal like that. And so once I would become the captain on these teams, I'm going to say, okay, I think I got something. I think I'm a little different, you know. And um, once I got to junior high school, uh, my football coach, Mr. Ola, would push me and my brother Larry and – I remember one time, Mr. Ola, he was my art teacher, too. He would make me speak in front of all these classes. And I said to him one day, I said, man, Mr. Ola, why do you always make me speak in front of people? That that ain't cool, you know? And he was like, son, you're a leader. And uh, I see it in you, but you don't see it in you. And that kind of that kind of made me think my little teenage brain for about two minutes, and then I was on thinking of something else. But it was like um, individuals like him, my pops, Larry Peaches, other pops, uh, Leroy Bell, but then just, I think, in the community, right? So in our communities, when we people see somebody has something special in them, we kind of wrap around them and try to and try to prevail their skill and try to uh, make sure that this person is um, staying safe. And so, like, uh, my, I had a godfather, Mr. Bowden. He would, he would, like, play with all the kids in the community, basketball, different things. And Mr. Bowden would pull me to the side sometimes and say, you know, you, you got the ability to lead everybody. You know, and so they're dropping them nuggets in my head, even though I w- really wasn't trying to hear it, was uh was was kind of settling in on me. You know, my older brother Marcel would constantly try to make me tough and kind of constantly want me to be better than um, what I was. And so, you know, it's like as I progress, it was sink in more and more. As I was in high school, I was the the uh, captain of the teams. I was um, prom king, blah, blah, blah. But I, I never <laughs> wanted to accept that I, it was me, right? And so when I got to mm-hmm. K-State, K-State, when I got to K-State, <laughs> I, <laughs> I tried to lay low. But that was just my whole deal, to lay low. Uh, that's how I grew up. It's a lay low mentality. And so, but uh, once I got involved with SDA and different uh, ambassador programs, um, and then when I once I became a member, you know, Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated became um, 
uh, the vice president. Uh, it was like, uh, I, I still knew I had it, but I didn't want to accept it, right? And mm-hmm. the leadership, the leadership was always there. I was always able to stand out. I was always able to to uh, get people to listen to me, but I didn't really want to accept it all the way. And once I really became a professional in the world, uh, I would be places and I would, I would, I would just listen to folks. And uh, I'm the type where when I do speak, I want it to mean something. And so I noticed when I spoke, people really listened. And uh, I'm like, man, I, and I realized it was a God-given ability. You know, and I'm like, um, now, am I going to use these powers for good, or will I use these powers for evil? <laughs> and so I chose to use them for good. And so, but overall, uh, my leadership skills have, have been developing ever since I was young, and it took me until um, once I graduated from college to really accept those skills and to um, challenge myself to, to take them to another level and to continue to let them grow. And so that was kind of like the storyline of my leadership development. And to this point now, um, where I'm at, I'm still challenging myself, you know? Right. I I love that because it is, you know, what our family members tell us is those nuggets of wisdom, those things that we uh, really hold on to, you know, be a, be a leader, not a follower. I mean, how many exactly. times do we, do we have, you know, parents or grandparents that, that say those nuggets, you, you know, my mom yeah. would always say, you know, use your head for more than a hat rack. I'm like, Okay, <laughs> no worries. Right. You know, so some of those things. So that's that's awesome. Uh, you know that that you were able to get those. You know, I, I say it. You know, talk less, listen more. So that being quiet, it sounds like you know that really helped you. You know, really being able to lead by example. Yeah, because I'm like the old cat now. I got nephews. I got young cats. I mentor or young women that's in the community that I'm constantly, I'm like the motivator. I'm like, you don't get something positive. You're going to get it. I have a dream speech for me, you know, at one point mm-hmm. in our conversation. And I, I catch myself, I'm constantly trying to drop that, but I tell them, I say, you know, you got to be willing to accept it. I can't want it more than you want it. Right. If not, if not, let's talk about something else. I'll support you regardless um, of who you are. But if you're not ready for uh, challenging yourself and me uh, mm-hmm. holding you accountable, let's talk about something else. Let's not even put that on you because I'm going to be on you if you want right. to get to the top. If you're trying mm-hmm. to get to the top, I'm going to help you get to the top. But if you BS us, let's just talk about sports or something else and not even play with it. Right. That makes sense. So you've done a lot of great work with the Los Angeles Mayor's Office of Gang Reduction and Youth Development over the years before transitioning to your current role in economic opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance of this work and the outcomes that ha- that it's had on the community? Because it sounds like you all have done a really uh, a lot of great things. You, you know what's amazing? I never thought that my um, surroundings growing up would play a part in me advocating for communities across the nation, let alone possibly the world. What I mean by that is, uh, and Gary, like growing up, I grew up during the crack era, and it was like everybody I knew was, uh, I ain't going to say everybody I knew, but a lot of people was, was game banging, you know, people mm-hmm. where they had to the left or to the right. <laughs> Uh, or people was in the dope game, and it was it was uh, it was just an era that we were surviving. We really didn't, um, I guess that's all we knew. And so mm-hmm. the gang culture was just a part of growing up from what I saw. Uh, the gang culture in L.A. People think just because movies like Colors or uh, Menace and all of that Menace to Society, you know, different movies. Boys in the Hood, you haven't seen movies like that, that the right. gang culture has, has kind of died down. But if you look at the uh, tragic loss of Nipsey Hussle, and people got uh, uh, kind of, not an introduction, but people who may not be around this area see that that life is still you know, still going, going strong. 
And so the gang law license in L.A. is still breathing. It's still, uh, it exists. And unless you, unless you really in the communities, you won't, you won't even know that because prior to me doing this work when I was in L.A., I never heard about everything that was going on until I got in this work. And mm-hmm. so that, that gang um, culture across the nation is still prevalent. And so with the work that was being done, once I got in, into the work and was placed in South L.A., which is really known as South Central, uh, it was like it was it was it was like an eye opener. The simple fact that there's so many people losing their lives or getting shot on a daily basis for the communities that they live in, or just fit a certain description. Mm-hmm. And and uh, the we 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 call them gang interventionists, community intervention workers. But they they like the lifelines in the community. A lot of gentlemen who may have lived that life, well, men and women who live that lifestyle, but are doing good for the hood now. And so, like, uh, these individuals are on call 24 hours a day. Like, I was on call 24 hours a day. You know, and it's, it's just like a dedication like none other that I experienced in my life. We were like first responders. We would go to different multiple scenes, different homicide scenes, officer law shootings. Uh, it's, it's just a really a, a eye opener. And so the work that the interventionists are doing here in Los Angeles gets accolades and praises from the chiefs of police, uh, accolades and praises from the mayor, uh, different, different community leaders, because we all know. A lot of times people in, 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 in our communities ain't trying to listen to the police, you know. Mm-hmm. The, the police realize they can't arrest their way out of this. You can't arrest everybody to solve the problem. And so it's a beautiful thing that's come together here where the community where uh, the community's doing the work, but uh, and there's an understanding that LAPD lets them do what they need to do, and there's no lines being crossed. The community let LAPD do what they need to do. And the homicide, since I've been involved since 2011, was going down every year. Back in the day, it was like thousands of people, uh, you know, uh, losing their lives to homicide out here. Thousands. Now I think last year it was under 300. And so I took my hat to them, you know. And as far as with the re-entry work, uh, going up again in the Midwest uh, during the crack era, People was getting more time to get caught with crack than they was uh, for a murder, almost. And so I will say this: I've been I've been uh, reading the uh, Michelle Alexander, the New Jim Crow, and she mm-hmm. breaks it down. She breaks it down on how all those laws was set and against inner city communities. You know, uh, it was just uh, very sad times. And so I experienced that, and I, I saw a lot of my friends during time that I grew up with, you know. And right. it, was just, it was just unfair because I went to a black school at one point, and I went to a white school. I would see some white kids, you know, they would do the drugs, maybe get caught and don't get much time. But the, the, my, my black friends who would sell the drugs would get all the time. And so mm-hmm. I was like, this is, uh, I was witnessing it, but not really, it wasn't registering. And so the reentry work now that I'm involved in, it's so pivotal because if you have someone coming out of the prison or jail system that is mentally unbalanced, that may need support, um, you know, with legal issues, with housing, you know, with employment, what else you going to do? And so now we got in line with the mayor's office of economic opportunity and office of reentry, you know, um, we, we uh, contract and community-based organizations to pretty much, um, support the efforts what they're doing along with our program to help welcome brothers and sisters coming back into our communities and give them that support they need. It's, uh, it's, it's really important. It's really important. And so I think, I you know, I, I applaud uh, both administrations I work for, Mayor of Villarreal and Mayor um, Eric Garcetti, for being advocates of this work because it's in our communities 
and our communities are suffering on multiple levels. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be a part, uh, I guess, of the answer and to work alongside some of these leaders out here in L.A. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a interesting. I, that's awesome with the stats, you know, that the homicide rates are going down over the years due to you all's work out in the community. And, and as leaders, we almost have to be, you know, chameleons. So in your current environment when you're out, you know, and you are going to various scenes, uh, whatever they may entail, that you have to be relatable. That's one of the things. I mean, you have to be raw and, and uncut so and so that there's that respect level uh, that's there because, if you came in polished and all of that good stuff, you know, you wouldn't be relatable. And so sometimes as leaders we have to be chameleon and have to be flexible and adaptable to whatever the situation calls for for the people that we are serving. So I'm exactly. happy, that, happy that you mentioned that. Exactly. I look at it as me. I'm just a brother who made it out the hood and uh, want to do good. And I know my lane in this work. You know what I'm saying? I think we all got lanes in this work. And so mm-hmm. uh, what I think what makes me relate to the South L.A. community so much is when I when I see South L.A. community members, it reminds me of friends that found me at home. You know, that's mm-hmm. – every it's not, it's, people I meet remind me of, of my family mm-hmm. or uh, uh, scenarios what I grew up in and survived. And so um, – for me to be educated and try to uh, come back uh, is, is, is God. It's a, it's a God-given um, blessing that's been placed on me. Yeah, that's a blessing to be able to serve and be able to help. And when you're passionate because you have been in that environment and you've seen that, it's easier to stay and do the work, especially when it gets difficult, uh, which being in the community, uh, whether it's the L.A. community or, or in our own communities, uh, doing the work of the community and of the people can get difficult and can get tiring. You definitely have to pa- have, to have the passion uh, to exactly. serve. Exactly. So. With that, what skills and qualities do you possess that you think have been most important for you to be successful in the work that you do to uplift our communities? I love to listen. I, I love to listen. Um, you can't come into a, a, a new community with all the solutions when you're not even from that community to know, understand the struggle. I think with all the different inner cities across America, there's a code of ethics that uh, the do's and the don'ts that we all know. But mm-hmm. but um, when I first came with the, into the city and the meetings, even though I was facilitating meetings with in the different community groups, organizations, and LAPD and different folks, I I wanted to listen. I would sit out to the meetings and talk to community members in the parking lot for an hour or two sometimes. I would uh, just to wrap the people because just like man to man or man to woman, besides the titles, let's put the titles to the side. Let's just talk. Mm-hmm. What's going on? You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's my approach. Treat everybody the same, you know, and I will always listen because uh, uh and, and once I got more and more familiar with what was going on, I, I was saying to myself, I can relate to these struggles. It, I kind of grew up with similar struggles. And as I started to learn and read more about some of the disparities that boys and men of color face and how uh, one of the most shocking, I guess, statistics was how uh, a lot of uh, Children in inner city grew up with asthma because of proper improper health care. And then I, when I read that, I said, wow, a lot of my friends did have asthma growing up. And so it was just, it's sad. It took that long for me to really understand what was going on. But uh, I, uh, you know, you, you have to really understand the post on the ground before you can offer real solutions. And, and I think I'm a firm believer of having people from that community at the table. 
Mm-hmm. You know, some organizations want to come in with all these solutions and with these plans drawn up. And there's some organizations that also like to have community members at the table, but just me personally, I like to have people from that community who know that community, who know all the struggles and at the table, you know? Right. Uh, they they have to be a part of the solution. Absolutely. I mean, that happens so often where, you know, boards and, you know, decision makers make all of these plans and all of these decisions to uplift and empower these various communities without talking to one stakeholder, and then they wonder why those proposed solutions do not work. So I absolutely agree. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> and you and you gotta employ people from the community too. You gotta mm-hmm. put money in people's pockets for that community. Right. But they need so to much. have a vested interest in the solutions. Thank you. Especially whoever your influencers are Preach. needs to be on board. Exactly. <laughs> 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 so You know, just like you, I work with a lot of young people, and so it's important for our next generation of leaders to not only hear about our successes, but to hear about some of our mistakes. You know, when we read our bios and, you know, they hear all the great things that we're doing, a lot of times it's missing, you know, all of our, you know, some of our mistakes, some of our failures, some of our, "Eh, I don't know why I did that, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but can you share with the listeners some of your biggest mistakes and some of the learning lessons that you gain from them? That's a good question. That mm, that kind of reminds me about the question when you're doing a job interview, and they're like, what's some of your weaknesses? And you're like, uh, mm-hmm. I don't want to tell you, but it's like <laughs> I think <laughs> I might not get the job, you know. And so uh, with this, I think, huh, if I think about it, um, I know at one point in my loss, my, my, one point in my life, I had uh, I lost a, a few family members, and uh, I think I took a step back, meaning like um, I stopped living. I was living on the outside, mm-hmm. but I really wasn't living life because how I grew up was you don't show your weaknesses. You don't show when you hurt, you know, you you got to walk to school. You got to survive. You got to, you know, be tough. You got to be a certain way. Mm-hmm. And so I learned I learned how not to really show my emotions. And so I had lost uh, some family members, and I was living life after that. And people who didn't know me didn't know what was going on deep down inside. And I took a step back. I just kind of uh, stopped communicating with a lot of friends and family. And uh, years went by, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, I constantly was, was seeking help from pastors and eventually went to therapists. I remember, I, I remember mm-hmm. one time my fans uh Get Ernie a shout out. He called me. <laughs> he called me one time on the phone. I was in LA. He was like, "What's up?" I'm like, man, I'm just leaving this therapist. He's like, "What happened? What's wrong with you?" I'm like, "Nothing. I just, you know, going to a therapist." Mm-hmm. And I guess the preconceived notion in a lot of black communities that like, you got to be crazy to go to a therapist, you know? And, right. Uh, yeah. And so I, you know, I tried that for a while, and eventually. After a lot of prayer, after a lot of good support from family and friends and sisters and brothers, and you know, I, I kind of came out of that and was like, I can't, I can't live my life like this. Mm-hmm. So you will mess around and right away. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who are dealing with trauma, who not getting professional help, who try to deal with it on their own. A lot of people self medicate. Mm-hmm. A lot of our youth are self medicating. Uh, uh, heavily now nowadays with all all this stuff that's out, boy, oh, I can't imagine. And so, uh, once I decided to live life again, it kind of uh, 
it really it really helped me out. But I was, you know, I, I was kind of not mad, but I was like, man, I didn't. I would just let so many years go by, you know, and I didn't. I think I had greatness in me. Well, I know I had greatness in me, and I just choose to take the back seat. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, why did I do that? But at the same time, I kept my sanity, and that was one of the main things I would pray through a lot, keep my sanity regardless of what I go through, and just keep a strong mind, you know. Right. Well, and that's, yeah. you know, and, and that's important for our our young people to hear because they they are dealing with so much, you know, there's so much going on. There's so much that's competing for their attention. There's so many, you know, there's just so much, you know, with social media, there's a lot. With their own personal lives, there's a lot. And their tolerance to understand it all is lower. And so that tolerance for pain and being able to deal with, you know, mistakes and trauma and and, and all of that is lower. And so you find it that a, a lot of our young people, you know, are hurting themselves because historically in the African-American community, you know, it is looked at this therapy, you got to be crazy or, you know, you know, some, something exactly. of that nature. You got to be traumatic, you know, African Americans don't go to therapists and you know this and that and then what happens is that our young people start to hurt themselves you know and luckily you know they don't go to the next level and and you know and kill themselves but some of them are but, but I mean, you know, I you know to, that's 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 been an increase in our communities um suicide has been the numbers been increasing in our communities mhm and again, because they feel like there's no, you know, no options. I mean, I had a, a close family member, you know, because they made a mistake. They made a mistake, and they're like, I don't think I can recover. And that one mistake turned into a series of mistakes, you know. And they're like, I don't think I can do this. And they tried to, you know, they tried to harm themselves. They tried to, you know, take their life. And if it wasn't by the grace of God, they would have taken their life because, you know, they felt like I made a mistake. I got to live up to some standard that I don't know who set. (laughs) And, you know, I feel like there's no way out. So, you know, thank you for for being vulnerable enough to share that uh, with our listening audience because that is very important uh, for them to know that, you know, when you experience those dark times or, you know, something is going on, you know, with family or yourself, you know, instead of kind of like checking out, you know, and and kind of disengaging or, or worse, that there are options out there. You don't have to be crazy to see a therapist. You know, yeah. if you are overwhelmed yeah. and overloaded with stress in life, you need to go talk to somebody. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, uh, it's a group out here called California for Safety and Justice, and, uh, and they kind of supported me last year. And um, it's a lot of individuals who lost loved ones, and uh, I'm like, wow, it's a group. It's, it's a group out here where you can get support, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's just different outlets. You know, it don't all have to be a therapist. It's different groups and ways and means for people to uh, to get help. Right. So I read about your uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization, DMTL, in which you are the president and founder. The organization is doing some outstanding work through its program models for gang prevention, delinquency prevention, and youth development services. Can you share with the listening audience more about what you and the team over there are doing? Tyree? Yeah, hello? Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. And so let me let me explain what um, DMTL is because a lot of times people have that question, what is DMTL? What does that stand for? What is it? And so uh, in 2002, I lost my mother and two brothers to gun violence. And so D is her first initial, Dolores, 
Marcel's my older brother, um, initial T for Tyree, which is me, and L for Larry. And so after that, I, I was saying to myself, you know, after years, I think two years went by, that they can be remembered by that event. That is don't, that is don't even represent who they were or what they stood for or what I, what they instilled in me. And so I was in California um, when I, when I uh, came up with it and I said, I'm going to do a nonprofit in their name and uh, uh, never did a nonprofit, never worked in the community. Um, I was like, my whole thing before that was just make money. I was like hustle man. Like back in K-State, Kentucky State, in Young Hall mm-hmm. in the dorm, I had mm-hmm. a barber shop. I had like a, a pawn shop. I used to like <laughs> I had work study. I was hustling. My whole thing was getting money. And so, but I think at this point, once I uh, went through those uh, traumatic changes, I kind of had to ask myself what makes me happy at this point. Because my, my whole purpose in life up until then was to take care of my mother. Become mm-hmm. successful, take care of my own. That was goal number one, point blank. And so, um, you know, with DMTL, with me kind of getting things together, I was blessed to connect with uh, Miriam Ali, Muhammad Ali's oldest daughter, who we call her May May. May May. Mm-hmm. And so we, um, we, you know, she was doing, she was heavily working in the communities in South L.A. Met her uh, doing, working down in the mayor's office, and uh, we was, like, on the same page on some effective programs that we think the community can really benefit from. And so right now we're in a point where we are fundraising, you know, um, to try to do this three-year pilot um, working with kids uh, from sixth to eighth grade, and we have a wonderful model that we want to implement and um, evaluate and share on a national level. And so we are uh, we're in, the, in the midst of fundraising gathering those funds together and trying to get this thing up and running so we can share it with the world. That's awesome. That's awesome. And that's a a great way to honor them and and leave a legacy. So that's awesome news. I'm all about leaving, having a living legacy and then leaving, you know, a legacy behind. So that's a pretty awesome, it's an awesome way to, to celebrate them. Thank you. What role has having a coach or mentor have in your life? Tyree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. And so I think I think that uh mentoring probably is has been so important in my life. Um, I think growing up, um, I'm a firm believer of multi-generational mentoring. I'll mm-hmm. break that down in a second. But uh, I think I think in life, like when I was younger, my mentors chose me, right? Mm-hmm. They, I think they saw something in me and wanted to push me to see if I was willing to accept the responsibility, something similar to what I was talking about earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I I wouldn't be here without, without all of the male mentors in my life, you know, going from uh, uh, Leroy Bell, Larry Peaches, Leroy Bowden, Sales, Mr. Ola, Porky. You know, I got, like, all these things. Miss, and then even K-State with Mr. Banks and Tommy Hayes. And, like, everywhere I go, I would, like, connect with a male figure that could put me on game because my theory was I want to be around somebody who could put me on game, you know, teach me a little something as well besides what I got. And so mentorship mm-hmm. is so important. Multi-generational mentoring is something that I use because I hear on the West Coast, um, I consider some of my mentors from this organization called Brother to Brother Mentoring Group, uh, Brothers Older brothers, a lot of them mentor me, along with some of the community individual workers, they mentor me. I pass that down to a few cats that I mentor in their 20 who are mentoring um, either high school students or uh, middle school students. 
and they teaching them how to mentor. And so we have to uh, divide the knowledge and don't hide the knowledge, but we got to look out for each other. A lot of times you got to realize it's uncomfortable for a young man to say, hey, can you help me? Uh, I need help. Uh, a lot of times, you know, people be weary in our communities when you come when you're trying to help people. They're like, what's the catch? You know what I mean? And so it's like, and, and so it, once you get past that level and people see that you genuinely trying to help them, uh, a lot of times the young men I've been through, they always say, what can I do, man? Well, you need help or something? I'm like, just once you get in the position to do the same thing, help somebody else. That's all I want. That's all I want from you. Pass it back down once you get to that level. And so, uh, it's it's really, it's really really important. I still, I'm look. I'm, I'm always looking for additional mentors because I'm always trying to elevate my game to another level. I ha- I remember one time I saw Magic Johnson and I hollered at him, and uh, it was a crazy story. I just share it real quick. I snuck in this event that Magic was giving. <laughs> so, <laughs> I heard it on the radio, Magic Johnson event. I put on the suit. I was snuck in the event through the back VIP. Towards the end of the event, when he was leaving out, we was in the kitchen, and I was walking towards Magic, and maybe uh, 20 of his staff and his wife Cookie was right behind him. And we walking towards each other, and I'm like, okay, maybe five feet apart. I said, what's up, Magic? I said, I just realized two weeks ago you my uh, you one of my idols, and he stopped. I said, yeah, we do the same work. I said, you know, it's on different levels, and we kind of took it from there. And, uh, you know, I wanted to build with Magic because when he's doing things happen in my life, we didn't make that connection. I say that to say this. We all need mentors, and I'm constantly mentoring people, and I'm constantly looking for mentors. So it plays an important role in our life. Yes, it does. So what would be one tip? One uh pearl of wisdom you would want to leave a listener audience with? A closed mouth don't get fed. Um, once you convince yourself that you're great, then you can convince others that you're great. Because if you don't believe in yourself, people can see it. People can feel it. People can hear it in your voice. Convince yourself. Get, get over the hump of you doubting yourself. Speak up when you have to. I'm a laid-back cat. I don't like to speak all the time. But when it's time to speak, I'll talk to Magic in the back of the kitchen coming with 20 people coming towards me. <laughs> so you got to know <laughs> you got to know how to speak when it's time to speak, you know? And um always ask for advice. If you're working with a, in your job, your company, let them know that you're looking to be in leadership positions. Let them know that you're hungry. Let them know that you uh, you're a team player and you're willing to help a- accomplish the goals and the mission, but you still looking to grow. So they can't read minds. Close mouth won't feed you. Stay hungry. This work that I do is bigger than my life. This work is about my family. This work is about it, our communities. And so I'm just humbled to be on your show. I'm humbled to share my experiences. And take care of the mental, physical, and spiritual self-care. Make sure you take care of yourself so you can help others. I know that was a uh, lot. <laughs> awesome. That is all good <laughs> advice. So, Tyree, how can our listeners stay connected with you and support you in your efforts? All right, cool. So you can go to uh, uh, our website, the DMTL website, the www.dmtlfamily.org. I'm in the process of writing a book. Stay on the lookout on a book. And the way you can find out about that is follow me on Instagram at T, as in Tom, Nason Buchanan, T-N-A-S-O-N-B-U-C-H-A-N-A-N. Follow me, see what some of my moves I'm doing next, uh, some of the projects I got going on, some great some great collaborations I'm working on. And uh and just hit me up. Hit me up. I'm a professional dot connector. I don't think that's I, I made that up, but I like <laughs> connecting people with other people. They call me awesome. Black Batman. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is awesome. Well, I'm interested in hearing more about uh, your future work and your collaborations and your yes, book. Yes, but yes. and then I'm sure we could talk for you know more time than we have tonight. But unfortunately, our time has come to a close. So I will definitely be on the lookout 
uh, for all of the great things that you are doing. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to give me the opportunity to interview you tonight. It was definitely an honor and a pleasure to have you as my guest. So many blessings and continued success to you, Mr. Mu- Mr. Buchanan, on your journey. Thank you, and, and, and excuse me. Like I said, I sound congested. It's cold out here. It's 60 degrees. So I'm sorry about <laughs> that. Just excuse me for that sound. No, oh, you are you were just perfect. So thank <laughs> you, listen. You were. <clears throat> So thank you, listener audience, for tuning in to tonight's show with our special guest, Tyree Nason Buchanan, where he shared that we we really need to take care of ourselves so that we are able to give back and give to others. Always be a leader. Treat everyone the same. Listening is important. You can't come to a new city, to a new organization, to a new uh, leadership table uh, with solutions if you don't understand the dynamics that are already in play. Pay it forward. We yeah. all need a mentor. Those things are – mentors are very important. A closed yeah. mouth doesn't get fed. Convince yourself uh, that you are great, and if you believe that you are great, others will as well. And know how yeah. to speak when it is time to speak. Yeah. If, so if you are interested in being a guest on this show, starting your own radio show or low-cost advertising – of your business or events, please email dibroadcasting at trendyelitellc.com. And please tune in next week to hear from another amazing leader. Until then, have a good evening. Thank you, friends, for tuning in to another episode of Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson, where Taiwana speaks with leaders who share nuggets of wisdom that you can use in your personal and professional life. Follow her on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Coach T. Wilson. Connect on LinkedIn or visit www.coachtwilson.com. And remember, in life, learn as much as you can, appreciate often, and lead fearlessly.